Good morning, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to this week's study. As we return to the questions that we were addressing yesterday in our conversation, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance, for his blessing, and for his direction, so that we may more fully understand what is written by Daniel the prophet and what we are to consider in all of the presentation that has been given regarding Daniel chapter 12. Shall we now ask for his guidance in prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for the many blessings that you are providing us. We thank you for your watch care and for your guidance. We know that we need you. Help us now. Direct us so that all that is done may bring glory to your name and to your character. I thank you for those that are attending in this meeting and those that will view it later. Be with us now. May your angels surround us. May your spirit open our minds. We invite you to join with us wherever we are. Help us to this end. For this we ask, this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we were at the point last when we met, what is meant by Daniel standing in his lot? Now, Smith makes a few points. Now, are we and do we, in looking at this, as we have when we're using ESORD, are we in agreement that Lot, according to Smith, is not a piece of real estate? I mean, we're looking at... It's definitely not a piece of real estate. Okay. But we're looking at, in this in this word, Hebrew 1486, we're looking at a number that can be transfigured to 1864. And according to what we find here, Goral has an unused root meaning to be rough as a stone or a pebble. That is a lot small stones being used for that purpose, figuratively a portion or destiny. Yeah, it has to do with like casting lots. That has to do with what? When they cast lots. Okay. Right. You know, the casting of lots when you make a decision. So that's what a lot is referring to. Okay. Now. So that's why it says destiny. Like it says destiny to stand in his lot or his, his chosen place, you know, chosen by God. His, his purpose is fulfilled. Another way to look at it. So two points. First, 77 times in the Old Testament is this word used. Second point, what other scripture comes to mind when we're speaking of lots? Well, there's the I'm thinking of, of the lots. Tr- the tribes coming in, in into the promised land, they they chose their land by lots. Okay. Yep. So they do that. And there's also the casting of lots on in Leviticus chapter sixteen, when they cast the lot for the two goats, one for the Lord's goat and the other for the scapegoat. Okay. Okay. So also have- yes, brother. It's one in um Acts too where they cast lots for um the two um disciples. Okay. Now, the one that I was thinking of is where the soldiers are casting lots for Christ's robe. So here is destiny. Christ was left without even his robe as he hung on the cross. The children of Israel received their inheritance by the lots that were cast. We have two that were where lots were cast to select Judas' replacement. So... All the way through, we find this is being used in both Old and New Testament. So Daniel's destiny was to be speaking figuratively at the end of time. Would we agree with that? Well, I just, I, I look at it not so much Daniel personally. It's, it's, um, I take this to deal with the book of Daniel and his prophecies. That's how I've always understood it. I don't, I don't take it as Daniel as a person. Okay. Now Smith writes, those who claim that the days are the 1335 are led to that application by looking back no further than to the preceding verse where the 1335 days are mentioned. 
Whereas in making an application of these days, so indefinitely introduced, we think of the whole scope of the prophecy should be taken in from chapter 8. Chapters 9, 10, 11, and 12 are clearly a continuation and an explanation of the vision of chapter 8. So that we may say that in the vision of chapter 8, as carried out and explained, there are four prophetic periods, namely the 2300, 1260, 1290, and 1335. Was Smith correct that chapter 8 covers four prophetic periods? Yeah, I'm not sure how he says that. Uh, chapter 8 doesn't deal with the 1260 or the 1290 or the 1335. Uh, it deals with the 2300 days and the 2520. Correct. So as he has written this, he's trying to link three different prophecies with chapter 8, which haven't even been mentioned. And he's wanting to set aside one that definitely is mentioned. Mm -hmm. The first is the principle in the longest period. The others are but intermediate parts and subdivisions of this. Now, when the angel tells Daniel <clears throat> at the conclusion of his instructions that he shall stand in his lot at the end of the days without specifying which period was meant, would not Daniel's mind naturally turn to the principle in longest period the 2300 days, rather than to any of its subdivisions. I look at this, and I have to ask, rather than the 2300 days, wouldn't Daniel be more concerned with the first vision mentioned <clears throat> rather than the second? The 1290 is where I... I'm not sure what you mean by the first vision. What's the first vision? Wouldn't that be the 2520? The panoramic oh, view? Which, yeah. Which 2520, though? I mean, it would be... Because uh, what's being referenced, when he stands in his lot, I believe is 1798 at the time of the end. Um, so the at the end of the days is not the 2300 days. It would be the 1290, which is going to be in 1798. So when, so I'm, looking, when I'm looking at this... Daniel would have sought to understand the calzone, but would have also then been brought to the vision, which is true, the mare, that he begins to ponder on by the end of chapter 8. Yeah, but here in this chapter, the, what's, what, what's being addressed is the 2520 for northern Israel, right? because it's going to be addressing... It's not going to be addressing the 2520 for Judah specifically, right? It's going to be addressing first the 1260, which is the scattering of the power of the holy people. That begins in 723 BC, right? Ends in 538. And then, and then he's going to be given the 1290 and the 1335, which both begin 30 years before uh, the end of the 1260. Right, because they're going to start with the taking of, of, away of the daily, not with the setting up of the abomination of the naked desolate. Right. So the 1260 isn't here explicitly referred to in chapter 12 for uh, the treading underfoot. That's chapter 7, verse 25, where you're going to have the time, times and a half that apply to the papacy. But Daniel must stand in his lot, not at the end of the 2300 days, right, or even the end of the 1335. He would stand in his lot when the book of Daniel is opened. Right. Right. So that's going to be 1798. So Smith, in his continuation, says, if this is so, the 2300 days are intended. And I personally would have to disagree with him. Mm hmm the reading of the Septuagint seems to look very plainly in this direction, but go thy way and rest, for there are yet days and seasons to the full accomplishment of these things, and thou shalt stand at thy lot at the end of these days. This certainly carries the mind back to the long period contained in the first vision in relation to these subsequent instructions, 
in relation to which these subsequent instructions were given. So Smith's view is skewed according to the opinion that he had presented in 1864. Yeah, but even then, even if he, even if he didn't believe in the 2020, it still wouldn't make sense. Um, you know, it, like even believing the way that he does about the 2300 days, it still doesn't make sense to say, say that Daniel stands in his lot at the end of the 2300 days. Okay. But I, I don't follow, I don't follow his reasoning. Right. So, I mean, he's going to try to say that, that he stands in his lot dealing with the judgment right so that's what he's going to do but that's not really what it's talking about it's it has to do with his purpose in the book of daniel not with him as a as a person individually and also um then you would because if you look at the next paragraph that's what how he's going to try to explain it this has to do with him standing in his lot that he's going to be judged so he's saying you know the judgment of of the righteous dead is going to begin in 1844, kind of doing it a roundabout way. And then he's trying to, uh, anyway, maybe you should read it first and then we can discuss it. I, I've just read it, but. The 2300 days, as has already been shown, terminated in 1844 and brought us to the cleansing of the sanctuary. How did Daniel at that time stand in his lot? Answer in the person of his advocate or our great high priest as he presents the cases of the righteous for acceptance to his father. The word here translated lot does not mean a piece of real estate, a lot of land, but the decisions of chance or the, pre or the determinations of providence. At the end of the days, the lot, so to speak, was to be cast. In other words, a determination was to be made in reference to those who should be accounted worthy of a possession in the heavenly inheritance. And when Daniel's case comes up for examination, he is found righteous. He stands, a place is assigned him in the heavenly Canaan. Does not the language of the psalmist have reference to this time when he says in Psalms 1, 5, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment? Okay, so he, he, he I, I'm not quite sure I follow because he seems to contradict himself because he says it's not a piece of land, real estate, and then he says it is. Right. So <laughs> it's just that it's a heavenly piece of land. Now, now the word lot, I mean, I'm not quite sure of the etymology, but often, you know, we're talking about an allotment, right? What, what is an allotment? I mean, the question is, does the word lot actually come from the idea of casting lots in the Bible? Is there a connection to to the idea of a lot as the casting of lots and a piece of property? Something set aside for somebody? Yeah. You know, I mean, when I think about, uh, you know, and I, I didn't look up the etymology of lot, uh, where it comes from. But I know that, uh, you know, my my grandparents, when we got land in Alberta, I mean, that, that was basically um, an allotment, right? They were allotted land by the government, you know, when they had a homestead. So I'm just wondering, is, if there, is there any connection to the idea of allotment, the casting of lots, and the word lot? as a piece of real estate. It is, I don't know. Uh, it's kind of, it, it is kind of interesting to me that the first five occurrences of Goral, the lot, occur in the book of Leviticus and all have to deal with the scapegoat and the Lord's goat. Yeah. Now, is Smith using a type of circular reasoning to defend his position? Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, so I was right. So the word lot comes from the sense of a portion assigned to someone, right? So the word lot is connected to the word allotment, which then would be connected to the idea of something, you know, at least in English, right? That has to do with the share of something. 
Okay. So, yeah. So, yeah. So when he tries to say it doesn't refer to a piece of land, I mean, it does, and he does use it that way. So the connection is, is there. But here in this case, when it comes to, to Daniel, um, he's trying to say, well, it has to do with Dan, when Daniel being judged. But obviously, Daniel still wouldn't stand in his lot in that sense until the end of the 2300 days, um, that is the end of the Day of Atonement, right? So not October 22nd, 1844. Right. Um, so because that's, so he's just saying when he's accounted worthy of a possession of the heavenly inheritance. So he says, well, Daniel's case is going to come up for examination, maybe right at the beginning, right? So, yeah, I don't agree with him as far as the reference to Psalm 1 verse 5 that this is, is what's being talked about. So it's not Daniel being judged and found worthy. It has to do with just simply Daniel's purpose or place. He's going to stand in his lot. He'll, he will be allotted a time in which his prophecy is understood. I mean, that's how I've always understood it ever since I or study it, so maybe I'm a little biased, just um, that's how I always took it, Daniel standing in his lot, so I mean, about that way for over 40 years, so I don't know, um, his doesn't really make sense as an argument, and I'm not really sure why he's he's trying to argue this, why he wants to go to the 2300 days, and not to the to the time at the end. Basically, I don't think they natu- naturally go to the 2300 days, as he says. I mean, I don't see why you would even bring that in. Sorry about that. No, no, you're fine. <clears throat> One thing that we've recognized when we consider the time of the end to the time on which the Seventh day Adventist Church was founded is we have that chiastic structure of 46 and 19. Where at the very beginning, when Israel was separated, we had the 19 years and then the 46 years. Yeah. Smith. Well, here I think that, okay, um, so I think here the lot is that period between the end of the 1290 and the end of the 1335. That's where Daniel is going to stand in his lot. Okay. Right, because that, that's the point where the book of Daniel is opened and applied. Right. So, so, I, so I kind of agree with you there, though the 19 years here is not being addressed. No. At this, just the, the 40, what you said, the 46 years, but here specifically, this is addressing the 45 years. And see, that's where I would think that I would naturally go, is I would say, well, he's going to stand in his lot at the end of the 1290. And to the end of the 1335. So that would be the place assigned for him in the context of what's been stated. Also, when it says at the end of the days, the way that I take that is you got two different days, the 1290 days and the 1335 days. Right. So in the sense of the end of both of those periods, that's when he's going to stand in his lot. That is, that's 45 years. Uh, it's a 45 year period. So, I, I think again, that, I would say the first of periods. I think that that would fit much better than the way that Smith is, a try, is trying to make this fit. Yeah. I just don't see how he brings the 2300 days into this at all. Uh, yeah, as you said, it's, it's like a circular reasoning. He tries to prove the 2300 days by. You know, first introducing it, and then he says, well, you know, this is the judgment, and so that's what it's going to mean that he stands in his lot. But it's he's ignoring lots of other things, pun intended. Okay, anybody else with comments on this? When Israel were about to enter into the promised land, the lot was cast, and the possession of each tribe was thus assigned to it. Each tribe thus stood in its lot long before it entered unto the actual possession of the land. The time of the cleansing of the sanctuary corresponds to this period in Israel's history. We now stand upon the borders of the heavenly Canaan, and decisions are being made 
assigning to some a place in the eternal kingdom, and barring others forever therefrom. In the decision of his case, Daniel's portion in the celestial inheritance will be made sure to him, and with him all the faithful will also stand. And when this devoted servant of God, who filled up a long life with the noblest deeds of service to his maker, though cumbered with the weightiest cares of this life, shall enter upon his reward for well-doing, we too may enter with him into rest, behold his rapture, and share his joy. It's interesting. Okay, so, go ahead. Okay, go on. No, go ahead. go ahead. Okay, so, I mean, he's made this argument about it not being a piece of property. And then, and then he's going to say it has to do with the decision made. Right. But a person's going to literally stand in his lot once he possesses the property, not when the decision of the case is made. So you can't say that each tribe stood in its lot long before it entered upon the actual possession of the land. Right. I mean, lots were cast and it was assigned to it, but they didn't stand in their lot until they possessed it. I don't know how you can say each tribe stood in its lot long before it entered upon the actual possession of the land, just because the lot was cast. Because we know that a portion is allotted to them, but nobody would say you stood in your lot just because it was apportioned to you. Just like my grandparents. I mean, they had land apportioned to them, allotted them, but they didn't stand it in it until they got to it. Well, Smith wants to say in one spot that it cannot be in reference to real estate, and now he wants to make it in reference to real estate. Yeah. Uh, well, and he wants to say, well, it's not when you actually get the real estate. It's when it's been allotted to you that you stand in your lot. Right. But, but that makes no sense. So, I mean, the only lot Daniel needs to stand in that's being addressed here has nothing to do with the 2300 days of the judgment. It has to do with uh, his prophecies, right? Because they're sealed up until the time of the end. And so right. when they're unsealed, then he will stand in his lot. That, that's the only logical, um, but I guess I have this sort of incredulity that, that Smith misses this pretty obvious way of understanding Daniel standing in his lot. I mean, this is an early writing of his uh, thoughts on Daniel. But I don't know if I ever read this before. Um, maybe he didn't even include this in the book. Or at least, you know, because this is not a really very logical argument at all. So I'm not really sure. I mean, he's obviously trying to introduce the 2300 days here and the judgment. But this is dealing with the unsealing of the book of Daniel, not with Daniel personally, uh, you know, receiving his inheritance. It's interesting for me, as you go through so much of Smith's written word, how many times he'll come to a point that can be controversial, can have issues, and he wants to talk around the point, but never really addresses the point. Well, sometimes he has weak arguments, and that's and he just he he tries to uh, sell you on his idea. He's not really examining it thoroughly, right. Yeah, but no. I, I really like to examine things thoroughly because I want to I want to look at the other options, you know, openly and honestly and, you know, evaluate them. Right. So he's not really letting us do that. No, he's not. Now, comment from the chat. Daniel stood in his lot on the charts, quite obviously, and in Ellen White's writings. When we take what Daniel has written. And we are examining it as Father Miller had showed us to do. We can determine more clearly how Daniel is standing, how he is speaking through his word now. But when we wish to set aside Miller's rules and set aside the light that Father Miller brought to the Millerite movement and to the church, then we wind up with situations like this. 
Yeah. Well, I was going through that uh, paper by Angel Manuel Rodriguez. Yes. Um, and, I mean, it's much worse than what Uriah Smith is doing. Right. I would assume so. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, I find it a little bit frustrating um, uh, when when I think about, you know, how we study. It's it's really looking at everything, right? We we're, we don't have tunnel vision in our approach. We can't afford to. Um, no, it's, it, and yet people, what they do is, it reminds me of backpacking or mountain climbing where, you know, they find a route and they get stuck on that route even when it doesn't make any sense. It's just, you know, they get this confirmation bias going. But also, it, it's not even logical. Like, Angel Manuel Rodriguez, his interpretation of, you know, Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45 is completely nonsensical. There's no, to me, when you have, when you're presenting something, you have, you have a thought or an idea. There, there should be a natural way in which that, that idea forms and develops, right? It should take into account all kinds of things, all kinds of details. It should tie together everything that we understand about scripture. But it seems that, that, um, People have ideas that that they're almost independent. It, it's like he doesn't consider uh, anything else other than his idea, and and he's trying to connect it to Egypt, right, to the Exodus. So he's trying to take the idea that Daniel 11 verse 40 to 45 is using the language of the Exodus, which you know it's not. <laughs> it, it's not referencing the the Exodus, just because it has Egypt as the king of the south, and it, it's it, it's it's a really poorly written article as well. I mean, it's, it's just not good prose. But um, but you know, we still see the same type of thinking even here with with Smith that he's he's got in his mind an idea, but he is not he's not letting us examine. It's not it's not pulling together. God's word. It's not shedding light upon God's word. It's not really illuminating anything. It's it's just an idea. Right? It's it's an opinion about something, and and not a very va- po- powerful or convincing opinion. No, it's not. Now, of course, he used the, he referenced the Septuagint, so he must be correct, which I, I shouldn't do that kind of mocking. But you know. That's that's what he's trying to do. He's he's using some, you know, polemical or maybe you know, uh, rhetorical sort of um, device, you know, to refer to. And, and Angel Man Rod, Rod, Rodriguez does this all the time. It's pretty much everything is polemic and and rhetoric. And and one of the things is it's just he he dresses up some poor ideas in very very fancy clothes. Um, so that you'll somehow see that he must be correct about what he's saying, even though you don't really understand what he's saying. And, yeah, he, and, and I'd rather I'd rather examine things thoroughly and understand them and make them clear so that the reader can examine it. He seems to dress his arguments in a manner that would be pleasing to those that really don't wish to dig deeper. Mm-hmm. And I think that's really, really common. I think people like to have things. I'm, I'm not really sure why, why people study the Bible. I mean, I was trying to figure out what was the purpose of Angel Manuel Rodriguez's article. When he, he's taking this, this path, basically his whole argument is I'm not going to make any real definite statements about Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45. I'm just going to play it safe because there's too many dangers if I try to understand it. So I'm going to, I'm going to look at it as in broad and vague a way as possible so that, um, and, and avoid any definite interpretation of the text. That, that's basically the position that he's taking. 
He's saying, you know, there's some language that connects it to Egypt, but I'm not going to make anything beyond that um, because we can't really understand the future. It's unfulfilled prophecy. And so it would be dangerous uh, to speculate at all. But but, you know, we don't speculate. What we do is we dig in God's word so that we can get a clear understanding of it. But I don't think he believes that we can clearly understand it. Okay. Another comment from so, the chat. Rodriguez seems to be one of the people that is proving the truth of Ellen White's writings, that our religion would be changed and books of a new order would be written. Yeah, well, we definitely were in the time of the books of the new order. Right. But yeah, I mean, his, his, his methodology that he presents is just so, so vague and uncommittal uh, to understanding Bible truth. I mean, basically, I guess the view that would be held by many scholars is we, we, we can't actually understand the Bible. And, and this reminds me of my dad, you know, growing up. Um, you know, he had this view that um, the book of Revelation was a closed book. You know, we can't understand it. Prophecy, we can't understand. And in some ways, almost like it's it's almost a mistake that it's in the Bible, right? Anything prophetic. And, and I think that's the view that really Adventism has, is, is this weakness of prophecy. We can't know the future, right? Which, which is true. We can't know exactly when Christ is going to return. But I'm not really sure why they even bother studying prophecy it seems the only reason they study it is to weaken it more than anything else. If we look to weaken prophecy, are we not then setting our position to be superior to God's word? Is this not a dangerous position for us to take? Yeah. So, you know, they talk about danger, right? They think the danger is, is looking at the Bible and trying to determine uh, the prophecies, especially anything that has to do with the future, that that's the danger. But I would think the danger is not doing that, not being prepared for the future by studying prophecy. I mean, is it really very dangerous to get things wrong once in a while? Just because you're trying to, uh, you're on a course, you're on a track, right? You need light for your feet. You're looking at fulfilled prophecy as it unfolds. And and those events that are unfolding, they're going to reflect back on past events. And then that's going to put light. They're going to shine forward on the path to give light for your feet. I mean, right. that's what we're doing. So, but for somebody who says, well, I can't really see into the future and decides not to continue on the path, right? Says, I'm just going to wait, um, you know, until Christ returns. And then, then I'll know what should have happened. You know they're they're not gonna they're not gonna continue on the path. We we don't have the light of the midnight cry guiding us if we think that watching and waiting is simply just waiting. Right. Because watching and waiting is watching and waiting. That is, we must be looking ahead. We must be on this path. And and that's why we measure the time. That's why we we look at prophecies. We look at the events that are unfolding, and we try to interpret them. In the context of the past, right? and if you look at what we've done with chronology, it was examining the prophetic periods, and we can see how, you know, Stephen has that chart where uh, we can see the two 1290s, right? we can see the two 30, 1335s, it, you know, that is, the present is connected to the past. Right. It's all part of uh, the structure of prophetic chronology. All of these chronologies fit together. And these histories in the past, Ellen White says, history in connection with this prophecy will be repeated. So that means we need to understand the prophecies cor correctly in order to understand their repetition. And, and that means that we can understand what's going to happen in the future if we understand what happened in the past. Okay, yeah, comment from the chat brings to mind Isaiah 29, 13, and 14. Why? I just think it applies. It says, uh, Wherefore the Lord said, For as much as this people draw near me with their mouth and with their lips do honor me, but have moved their heart far from me, 
and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. Therefore, behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people, even a marvelous work and a wonder, for the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hid. Okay. Thank you. Now, Smith finishes this with a portion that was not published in his books. After many interruptions and delays, which have been unpleasant to the writer and have doubtless detracted from the interest which may any may have felt in these articles, we at length draw the thoughts of Daniel to a close. Now, let's remember, this is being published on July 18th of 1871. One eight seven one eight seven one. With no yeah, and, and just, just a thing to remember about one eight one eight seven one is that if you take one eight seven, that's the number of days from the spring equinox to the autumnal equinox, and then if you read it in reverse, one seven eight. That's the number of days from the autumnal equinox to the spring equinox. So we often think that they're equal and they're months the way that, you know, we look at the seasons, we just get that impression. But actually the, the period of time from the spring to the fall is longer than the time from the fall to the spring. That actually, you know, quite a bit different. Um, and, and you can see that 187 plus 178, if you add that together, what do you get? 352, isn't it? No. 187 plus 178. Sorry. 365. Right. So you get the 365. So you can see that. Now, it's interesting that God has from the first day of the first month to the 10th day of the seventh month, 187 days. An inclusive count, but still, it's 187 days. And then you would then have 178 days in a solar year, right, back to the same date. Of course, they don't use a strictly solar calendar, so it's going to vary the number of days from the 10th day of the seventh month back to the first day of the first month in, in the following year. But you can see and, and that it is, in some ways, it must be connected to the fact that the spring equinox to the fall equinox is that period of time. So that's just so I so that's what I see when I see one eight seven one is I see the three sixty five days of the year in that symbol. If that makes sense to people, hopefully. Okay. Now another comment from the chat was that this article was published twenty seven years to the day of Snow's confirming the covenant. Rather interesting. Yeah, 18, Go ahead, please. Yeah, just 1844. 1844 to 1870. Well, I, I'm looking at it, I mean, especially with, with 20, with, with 27 years, you're looking at three by three by three. Okay. With no small degree of satisfaction, we have spent what time and study we have on this wonderful prophecy. And in contemplating the character of the most beloved of men and most illustrious of prophets. God is no respecter of persons, and a reproduction of Daniel's character will equally secure the favor of God. Let us emulate his virtues that we, like him, may have the approbation of God while here and dwell amid the creations of his infinite glory in the long hereafter. Now, with this, Smith puts his initials, U.S., so that there would be no question that he had written this article and this series of articles. Now, <clears throat> I get a bit intrigued when you brought up Angel Rodriguez's articles, especially since I've had issues at times with a lot that he's contributed with different Sabbath school lessons. That's one of the main reasons why I don't choose to read those lessons any further. From another point, I had looked and was led to look at another um, book that was recently published. Now, here we have 
what is part of a book from Eugene Pruitt. The title of this book is Deeper Pruitt. And I find it interesting that this book on the front cover shows a shovel and it's it says deeper, investigating the integrity of our prophetic foundations. This book was copyrighted in 2009. So it would have been out about eight years after September 11, 2001. Here Smith begins. There was a time, not getting true, it begins, excuse me. There was a time when Adventists were mostly united in their views of how the prophecies of Daniel should be applied. Ellen was shown something of this in her early careers as a messenger. When union existed before 1844, nearly all were united on the correct view of the daily, but in the confusion since 1844, other views have been embraced and darkness and confusion have followed. <clears throat> Time has not been a test since 1844 and will never again be a test. Now, it's interesting that Pruitt wants to use a very broad stroke about Adventists being united in their views of how prophecies were to be applied. And yet she he comes back to a very focused address regarding the daily. Stephen Haskell read more into this statement than it said. Long after this was written, when all were again seeing other views being embraced, Haskell reminded the church about this statement. On the basis of it, he held that the new views, such as the view of William White and others regarding the daily, ought to be in, abandoned in favor of Miller's view. Ellen did not support Stephen in his efforts to support her. As God's messenger, she refused to be a substitute for Bible study. And she refrained from giving support to one side or the other of an issue of lesser importance that, that threatened to divide the brethren. He continues. I don't know why he says page, I don't know why he says page 75. Because it is page 74. It ends on page 75. Right. But you generally don't um, uh, give where it ends. You start on the page where it begins when you give a Correct. quote. So it, it is early writing 74. I was wondering why he was doing that. Um, and obviously it starts, you know, with the September 23rd, the Lord showed me, which we know is October 23rd. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's early writings page 74. Then I saw in relation to the daily that the word sacrifice, etc. Unless he's, wh where does he start the quote? Does he start when union existed before 1844? Or does he start it? Yeah, oh, so that's why he puts 75. Because he's going to start, he's not going to start with the paragraph. He's going to start with just the last sentence of the paragraph or the last two sentences. Okay. See, if we, so if, correct. we if we read the entire portion in context, then mm -hmm. he would have to start this on page 74. Yeah. Now, he of course, I wrote a paper on this. We, we did a detailed study of early writing 74, uh, you know, and all the different versions of that vision that Ellen White wrote out or that are, uh, were published. This is originally published in The Present Truth in November of of uh, 1850. Right. Right. And then it, it's in early writings and it's in spiritual gifts. And um, but the whole the whole vision isn't really included in here. So the the actual vision, the way it was originally written out, has a lot more detail in it. I'm going to mention S Sister Minor by name, for instance. But anyway. That's it's sort of an aside here. Um, just wanted to deal with that detail. Okay, go on. Well, as as we would look at this, as we would consider this, here is where Pruitt would have us to begin. Now, it always intrigues me when we're looking at these 
warnings that are given, and we want to use the compilations rather than source documents for the understanding of what's being said. Well, there's even even a bigger problem here. So one thing I always find, we, we have the same thing with the 2520 and the same thing with the date. Instead of trying to understand the 2520, or instead of trying to understand the daily, they're always going to go to these statements where it's it's being debated, if you understand what I mean. They're going to be arguing over what Ellen White meant by her letter to Stephen Haskell. And, and to me, the really obvious thing is what Ellen White is saying is you, if you read the whole context, as you, as you note here, is that they were to get together to study these things and not just depend upon what her statement said, because that wasn't where, it, it's, it's not about a debate what Ellen White said, it's about what the scriptures say. Right. Would you agree with me on that, right? So, and when they take these quotes, they take that out of that quote, for the most part, people ignore all of this. They just they'll say, "Well, can't use my 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 statement to sustain their views of the daily." And the question is, who? Now it has elders H, I, and J. I don't know them personally, but um, it's much better if you have who they were. That they should make no reference to my writings to sustain their view of the daily. So, do you know who H, I, and J are? I'm looking right now to see if I can find the original document quickly. Now, because uh, my understanding is that she's talking about those who are presenting the new view of the daily. Right. But, yeah. Right. So her writings are not so supposed to be used to settle the matter. But that's what it was really an argu argument about was, um, you know, Ellen White said we were united on the true view of the daily. And so, you know, what did she mean by that? And, and that's obviously not well understood because nobody understands what the daily is. I mean, it's pretty clear in, her, in uh, Great Controversy, Chapter 3, that Ellen White is presenting the pioneer view of the daily when she's doing the study of Second Thessalonians, Chapter 2. She's just basically presenting the pioneer view of the daily. But they're arguing about the word the daily and what Ellen White means rather than actually studying it out. Right. It's interesting to to look at this. I've now scanned from the very beginning, and I'm up to the letters in 1910, and I'm still having trouble finding this exact quote in, in the original documents. Do they give us a reference of where it comes from originally? I'm not seeing it. Okay. Okay, maybe I found it. Hang on. Okay, manuscript 11, 1910. And it says that the manuscript was published in pamphlet 020, pages 5 to 10. So we're manuscript 11, 1910. I'll have to look for that pamphlet because I'm not finding it. The original document is titled Our Attitude Toward Doctrinal Controversy. This document was apparently written 31st of July of 1910. July 31st in 2020 is the other date we had uh, because it's July 18 in 2020. It's July 18 um, on the Julian calendar, right? So that was the 10th day of the fifth month symbol. So we had July 18th and July 31st, 13 days apart with the 26th day of the fourth month and the 10th day of the fifth month. So it's kind of interesting. Yeah, because... So this, start, this starts with the, the this statement. So this is the beginning of it. Right. It, it, it's intriguing since that, that comes up in 1910 as being the 18th of July on the Julian calendar. In 2020. No. Well, 19... I, guess, I guess in 1910 as well, yeah, because it's in the... Uh, the 20th century. So the 20th and the 20th century, the, the Julian and the Cal, uh, Gregorian are 13 days apart. Yeah. Exactly. So it is July 18th. Yeah. 
So this is actually written to Haskell, Loughborough, and Smith, the ones who are on the side of uh, the old view. Right. So as this as this is originally written, I have words to speak to my brethren east and west, north and south. Now, to me, that denotes all over. I request mm -hmm. that my writings shall not be used as the leading argument to subtle questions over which there is now so much controversy. I entreat Elders Haskell, Loughborough, L.A. Smith, not Uriah Smith, a different okay. and others of our leading brethren that they make no reference to my writings to sustain their views of the daily. Now, let's be direct. Uriah Smith had been dead by the time this document is written. Yeah. It has been presented to me that this is not a subject of vital importance. I am instructed that our brethren are making a mistake in magnifying the importance of the difference in the views that are held. I cannot consent that any of my writings shall be taken as settling this matter. The true meaning of the daily is not to be made a test question. I now ask that my ministering brethren shall not make use of my writings in their arguments regarding this question, for I've had, I have no instruction on this point under discussion, and I see no need for the controversy. Regarding this matter under present conditions, silence is eloquence. The enemy of our work is pleased when a subject of minor importance can be used to divert the minds of our brethren from the great questions that should be the burden of our message. As this is not a test question, I entreat our brethren that they shall not allow the enemy to triumph by having a, it treated as such. The work that the Lord has given us at this time is to present the people the true light in regard to the testing questions of obedience and salvation, the commands, commandments of God, and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, she goes on quite a bit in this, but very specifically, rather than the redaction of the names of who this was being written to, when we are looking at Elder Haskell, Elder Stephen Haskell, Loughborough, and L.A. Smith, we're finding three people that were standing for the old view of the daily being paganism. And she's having to say that this is not to be a test question. Now, Pruitt, after taking the redacted version of this document, continues, there are other views that the brethren were united on in 1844. Their understanding of the 1260-day prophecies and of the 1290 and 1335 prophecies bore a remarkable similarity to each other, but it is not so today. So in 2009, as he's writing this, a prominent evangelist has written a book that gives a futuristic evangelist application of the 1290 and 1335 day prophecies a televised sabbath school program on 3abn dished out a similarly future interpretation of these two and these two notable examples are only notable for the status of the teachers so many others have made similar interpretations that neither of these two are remarkable for their content Common to many schemes of interpretation among Adventists today is the thought that there indeed has been a historical fulfillment of these prophecies that can be placed on a timeline. But added to this is the thought that a more important and relevant future fulfillment is yet future. And so more than the other prophecies, one's understanding of the 1290 and the 1335 hinges on how one views the question of dual application in prophetic interpretation. How do you take what Pruitt is writing here? Well, I actually like Pruitt quite a bit in, in a lot of ways. So when it comes to dual application, people mean different things by it. So one thing we don't do is we don't take a prophecy in the past and reinterpret it in the future. Our movement doesn't do that. Correct? Correct. 
What we do is we look at a prophecy in the past and we seek to understand its fulfillment in the past. But we know that history is going to be repeated. That the events of the past are typical of events in the future. And the difference is extremely important because when you take a prophecy and you reinterpret it, you can almost do anything you want with it because it's it's a future prophecy, right? Correct. But if if we follow the pattern of Millerite history, if we have that template, we have the line upon line, then when we look at a prophecy in the past, it it restricts us in our in our um, in what in how we interpret it, how we interpret that history being repeated, right? So when people apply prophecies, they will have, well, they will say something like, you know, we have this prophecy here that was dealing with the papacy, but now we're going to reinterpret and the king of the north in our reinterpretation is not the papacy. It's going to be Islam or something like that, right? You know, or the king of the south isn't going to be Turkey. It's going to be um, Islam, right? Uh, you know, different different ways people do it. So there's all kinds of interpretations. But the point is, they're reinterpreting the prophecy. They're giving it a future application directly rather than understanding it in the past. So, so I'm not sure where he's going to go with this. I mean, I, I know that he would not be in favor of these future applications of prophecy, like the 1290 and the 1335. Uh, and of course, what people are going to do, they're going to put them into literal time. So Jeff was always opposed to uh, people taking the 1290, the 1335, and other periods and using a day for a day. And some people would be surprised because they say, well, we recognize, you know, periods of 1290 days, but we recognize them as symbols. We have never made a prediction based upon reapplying a prophecy uh, to get, you know, it's going to be 1290, it's going to be this many days from such and such event. We've never done that, correct? Right. And uh, on the surface, some people will look at our charts and see, oh, you know, they got, well, maybe they look at something we have, you know, January 5th, uh, 1868, uh, and then we count 1290 days to July 18th, 1871, and they would think that we're reapplying the prophecies in that way. But we just see that these are symbols. Right. Um, so, yeah, it, it's kind of frustrating in the sense that these counterfeits of what we do, I don't even know if counterfeit is a good idea, but or a good way of explaining it because they're not really counterfeiting it. They're just totally misapplying it. They, but it, it confuses the issue, right? Because people think that we're, we're time setting in the way like we're using futurism or something, uh, but we're not. And, and the other thing about this type of interpretation is, is that often, even though we've applied it in the past, they will say, well, that was, a mistaken application, right? So that really the primary application is this futuristic one. So so they can sort of say, well, you know, they applied it that way and it had meaning to them at that time, but really they were wrong in what they did. And, and that you'll see very predominantly in this sort of futuristic applications. It was only partially fulfilled or it never was really fulfilled even though they made those applications of the 1290 and the 1335 or other prophecies. And so we look for a future fulfillment of those in literal days. So anyway, what it doesn't do is it doesn't make old light shine brighter. No, it certainly doesn't. Now, Pruitt had continued stating, I am not interested in using Ellen White as a, as a leading argument in settling the question of the 1290 and the 1335 day prophecies. I do think we can settle the question well with scripture, and then we would do well to heed what she has to say on the topic. The final revelation to Daniel is found in Daniel 11 and 12. 
There, the history of over 2,400 years is briefly outlined. The concluding elements are found in Daniel 12, 1 to 3. These are the deliverance of God's people during the time of trouble, the special resurrection and the glorification of the saints at the beginning of their everlasting life. Then he states that then Daniel is ordered to close and seal his messages until the time of the end. Now, he continues, <clears throat> when the scroll is unsealed, when men can finally understand it, they will move accordingly. They will unroll the scroll and hasten up and down it to be able to, to be able to study its various parts. And they will accordingly come to understand it. Knowledge will be increased regarding the book of Daniel. But the book was sealed for the time being. An angel nearby asked the question that Daniel must have been wondering. Here he quotes Daniel 1, 12, verse 6, 126. Jesus swears in the next verse that it will be at the end or the accomplishment of the 1260-day scattering period. This is neither the first nor the last reference to this same period of time in the scriptures. <clears throat> These 1,260 prophetic days mark the period in which the papacy held the position of successor to Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome as master over the known world. Now here, he's taking a very classic Adventist understanding. But as I noted, as I read through this, he went out of his ways not to give reference to anything having to do with the seven times of Leviticus. Yeah, and of course, he, he's not going to recognize that this is the 1260 years of the scattering, which is done by the daily. Correct. It's the daily that does the scattering. Uh, and so, but, but yeah, I, I mean... I mean, I've never seen an Adventist who, even people in this movement, generally would not recognize uh, Daniel chapter 12, verse 7, that the time times and a half is a reference to the first 1260. Right. Right. But but Miller taught that it was, though, in his modified way, starting it with 677 and then having that 1260 of the papacy sort of cut out of it, and then the 45 years at the end. We know that that's, that wasn't correct. But he had the right idea. He, he would see that the scattering is done by paganism. Now, he continued, though the papacy was powerful even in the 4th century, though she converted many pagan tribes in the 5th, it was not until the 6th that she mounted the dragon that she is pictured as writing in Revelation 17. In other words, not until the 6th century was the papacy in control of a nation. Only then did she become sovereign in the feudal-like system. She became a civil power, allowing her to appear in the empire prophecies of Daniel 7 and 8, when the Pope became a feudal lord over the Franks in 508. That was the beginning of her existence as a state. She became the world's dominant civil power when she became feudal lord over the city of Rome and of the Eastern Roman Empire in 538. So again, we have, you know, almost a different interpretation of how uh, the 1290 and the 1335 start. Right. Um, right. So, and this is something that we do need to thoroughly examine. It is, how do we understand the start of the 1290s. How did Miller understand it? How did that sort of change over time? And also with 538. Now, th these prophecies, I mean, I, I don't know how many people have read Heidi Hike's books, but Heidi Hike, he, uh, even though his name is Heidi, he's a guy, which really bothers Heidi, by the way. <laughs> really? But, uh, really? Yeah. yeah. Why does that guy have her name? Uh, especially when he's a bad guy. Um, but, you know, he has, like, this totally different interpretation of, of, like, he retains those dates, and he has, like, the 508 source book and the 538 source book, but in, in doing so, uh, retaining those dates, 
he's he's still undermining the the prophetic foundation. So he does it in a very clever way. And and he's going to have, of course, the new view of the daily, right? So he's he's trying to dismiss the, the pioneer understanding of the daily and still retain those dates. Right? Because some people uh dismiss the daily, but they, they also uh, dismiss the dates. So Heidi Hike is sort of a champion of uh, some conservative Adventists because he he can have the new view of the daily and he can also have the date. So he can have his cake and eat it too. But but we see there are different interpretations. And I know that uh, Stephen is, is interested in really examining that further. He's done some work on it. Right, Stephen? I got a diagram this morning. Actually, just from the uh, from the CD-ROM with the pioneer writings, I just went into which which ones actually commentated on 508. Yeah. And uh, pieced together just in a brief form. You can sort of see what they said relating to 508, how they, how, how they differed. So mm-hmm. you had Lich, Lich saying the Ostrogoths convert to Christianity. Smith saying Arthur became becomes king of Britain right. at that time. And you have Haskell saying the Britons accept Christianity. And then Hines, he says the Italian with an army of Huns and Bulgarians caused the taking away of the pagan rights at Rome. And then uh, there's someone who's maybe the closest called the Elder H, and they were sort of contending against him in his uh, understanding. Um, but he says Clovis abolished daily pagan worship and set up in its place the Roman Catholic religion. But he didn't give any historical support, from what I understand, but relating to what the modern uh, group of historians saying 508 relating to the baptism of Clovis, that would maybe seem the closest of um, what mm-hmm. I found there on the CD wrong. And then Miller himself, he said about the conversion of the Ten Kings to the Christian faith, was his application. So he didn't even relate, I don't think he related to the three that were propped up and saying it was like the Seven Kings. He just said it was conversion of the Ten Kings. Yeah, and, and then we have the same sort of problem with 538 as well, that there's lots of different interpretations of, of what, what it... Now, the one thing that we have that, that of course, um, that almost no Adventists have now is the 666 years that Miller has connecting uh, 158 BC to 508. And then we also have, in addition, the 1335 that connects uh, to the first league with the Gibeonites to the league with the Jews. And so we got the 1335, the 666, and then the 1335 again. Um, and then then your recent diagram uh, dealing with the 1290. And that's going to be connecting uh, to Rome as well, but to the founding of Rome, whether it's it's actually founded at that time or not, but at least as a symbol. Yes. Right. So, so, um, so 753 BC. So, so that becomes, you know, my view, these, these become really powerful arguments that connect these dates. And, uh, I know our time is almost up, done here, but I mean, at some point we're going to have to really study this thoroughly. But, you know, 1260 years from the founding of Rome to 508. Uh, paganism being taken away. So one of the things we know in the scriptures, we have to figure out what does it mean that the daily is taken away and the abomination of desolation being set up? What specifically is it referring to? And I think part of the problem that we have going back to what Ellen White's saying um, in early writings, page 74, is that there was a lot of light still to be had by the study of the daily and so forth. And if they had followed her advice that they were to sit down and study together, light could have come from, you know, God's word 
So you had one group that's having this new view that's rejecting the old, and then you have another view that's holding on to the old but refusing to see any new light, right? So both, both in a sense, are in error because it's fine to say, well, Ellen White says that they were united on the true view of the daily, but what does that really mean? You know, what light is going to come from the daily? So we have to be be aware of of that, you know, because some people want only the light that they have already. They're not interested in new light, and I think Ellen White was. As you note, we are close to our time for the end of today's study. So we're going to come back to some of this tomorrow. Any other comments or thoughts at this time? I want to thank you all for your contributions today. So shall we now close with prayer? Loving Father in heaven, thank you for helping us to understand and to puzzle and wrestle with your word. Help us to come to a clearer understanding. Be with us today. Guide us in all that you would have us to do. May your will be clear. May your character be shown to all of those with whom we come in contact. Thank you for this time that we spent together. Direct us now in all that you would have us to do for this day. For this, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.